The following is an AZPM original production. For AZPM, I'm Mark McLemore, and this is Arizona Spotlight. Coming up, a tale of true love that began in Tucson in 1943 and continues today. Reporter Henry Breen wrote about an enduring connection for the Arizona Daily Star, and he'll share the story behind the story of Christine and Ward. Visit the unique Tucson landmark called the Valley of the Moon. It's been a monument to kindness and childhood magic for 101 years. Marquez Price, an author, poet, and entrepreneur, shares an essay about his attempt to do a digital detox, to reconnect with the world around him and engage fully in the relationships that matter most. And go inside AZPM's film, tape, and video vault, where more than 65 years of local television history is being digitized and preserved. We'll share some stories you may remember. That's all next on Arizona Spotlight. A recent article in the Arizona Daily Star, written by Henry Breen, told about a love story that began in Tucson in 1943 and that continues today. At the age of 17, Christine Grady met 19-year-old U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Ward Sackle at a USO dance at Tucson's Pioneer Hotel. That was in January of 1943. Sackle was from Connecticut, but was finishing training at davis Monthan to serve as part of a B-24 bomber crew. The young couple's time together only lasted about two months before Sackle was deployed to the European front, where sadly he was killed in action. Now at age 98, Christine Grady Gorder has traveled to France 11 times to put flowers on Ward's grave. She's currently planning a 12th visit. Her commitment to honoring his memory touched the hearts of many readers. And next, Alicia Vasquez talks to Henry Breen of the Arizona Daily Star to get the story behind the story. We're here to discuss the story you wrote about Christine Grady Gorder. I guess, can you start off by telling us how the pitch came to you? Yeah, it was pretty simple. She read something in the Star about uh, another veteran story. Um, and it sort of resonated with her. So she reached out to us, actually. She had just published uh, sort of a memoir about uh, her experience and uh, thought we might be interested in her story. And obviously, we very much were. What's something about the story that made you specifically say, like, yes, this is it. I want to run with this. I, I want this story. Oh, boy, there there was a lot of elements to it. Um, and as I you know, sort of researched it more, it became more and more interesting to me. But um, one element I really enjoyed was it's this wonderful snapshot of what Tucson was like uh, in the heart of World War II um, that I think, I mean, obviously, Tucson was a much smaller place back then. And um, very few people are around who lived that experience. So it was a very interesting snapshot of what Tucson was like and the University of Arizona was like at that time. Um, And then the detail that really got me was when she was telling me about how she has flowers Uh, placed on his grave um, like six or eight times a year. Um, That I found very moving, the idea of this this young man who was killed uh, in 1943, um, and he has this grave marker in France, uh, a place he probably never got to visit. Um, And he, you know, even today there's flowers being placed, fresh flowers being placed on his grave. It just, that, that detail really got me. How is this story different from others you've had the chance of reporting on in the past? Well, what's interesting about this to me was um, she's she's 98 years old, um, so she's lived this this history that a lot of people just read about in books. Um, she was going to she was a teenager going to the U of A in, in 1943 when she met this guy, so to hear firsthand accounts of what life was like here and what the war was doing to the community and the world at large, straight from somebody who lived it, was was very interesting to me. Her life in general is very interesting, aside from just her connection to this young man. Um, and I include some of that because it's in her memoir. But, you know, after they parted ways and he was killed, um, she lived a very interesting life. She, 
you know, studied Spanish at the U of A and she went to linguist school. She ended up working for the CIA right after the CIA was founded and was posted in Havana before um, Castro. And she was posted in South America and traveled all over South America as a young woman uh, working for the CIA. So uh, very interesting life. And um, I didn't get too into the weeds on that stuff because it wasn't relevant to the specific love story, but a very interesting uh, woman for sure. Tell us about meeting her for the first time and the impression she made on you. Yeah, she's um, she's she's impressive. She's uh, I hope I'm in the kind of shape she's in when I'm you know sixty. Honestly, she's uh, she lives by herself in the same house she's lived in on the east side for I think she said over fifty years. She has people come in and help her because she has some you know some medical issues. She uses a walker and things, but I mean she's not very limited. I mean, she travels to to Europe by herself, um, you know, with some help. But um, uh, she's just a very independent, um, very with it, eloquent person. She was she was impressive. How would you describe uh, Christine Grady Gorder in three words? Who uh, determined, um, passionate, and sharp. What was the process for getting everything and describe the experience as well? This one was a little challenging because it's kind of a not quite a one source story, but I mean the, the whole story is coming coming from her, and and obviously, the other person involved in this love affair has been dead since 1943, so that's a bit of a complication. But she kept a diary, uh, pretty much from her college years on. So she she actually has sort of primary sources, written sources she can refer you to where she writes about um, these experiences she had, and then you know you can do some sort of tangential research, I guess you'd call it. Like she was telling me things about the U of A uh, in 1943 about how women outnumbered men because most of the men were, were off serving and things like that. And to try and verify some of that stuff, I actually found an online research that has uh, yearbooks scanned in from cover to cover uh, online that you can flip through. And it was really interesting to look at like the, the 1943 U of A yearbook and then the 1944 U of A yearbook is completely different. The, the number of men uh, in the photos drops and there's stuff in the introduction about how um, they elected uh, like their first woman student body president because <laughs> I guess because there were so few men on campus at the time. But it was just, just the transition from you know, the regular college life to wartime college life was was right there on the pages. And it was just really interesting to go through and and look at that stuff. Have you been able to stay in touch with her since? Yeah, we exchange emails pretty regularly. She's promised to, uh, she's headed back to Europe um, in just a couple of weeks for the um, 80th anniversary of something called Operation Dragoon, which is sort of the the second D-Day in France where we invaded the southern part of the country. She's going back for that. Um, and she's going to visit, you know, her a sweetheart in, uh, at the graveyard as well. So she's promised when she gets back, she's going to give me, a, give me a full report on on her trip. And hopefully we'll see some pictures and catch up. What's the reader response been to the article? I got a pretty good re- reader response from it. I think people were pretty um, charmed by the, the sort of sweetness of the love story and, and the fact that she's sort of kept the, the fires burning for this guy for for so long. She kept saying when I talked to her that that she didn't want the story to be about her and she really wanted to sort of highlight the sacrifice that that these young men made during World War II. And, and I totally agreed and I, I hope they came through with the story, but her story is just so extraordinary. It was really just me not messing it up because it's such a, such a great story. Well, thank you so much, Henry. Yeah, thanks for having me. You can find a link to Breen's full article, Love Still Blooms, on the Spotlight page at azpm.org. J.R.R. Tolkien once wrote, Not all who wander are lost. And there's a certain place in Tucson where that is especially true. The enchanted world of Valley of the Moon. It's a place of winding footpaths lit by colored lights, home to a variety of artifacts, sculptures, and tiny houses. Lucky visitors may even catch sight of some of the fantasy creatures that live there. 
I visited Valley of the Moon for my first time last fall and brought back this audio postcard. I began by talking with Kirsten Yaffe. She's Valley of the Moon's treasurer and the organizer of their docent program. I asked her to begin by telling me about Valley of the Moon's founder and designer, George Legler. He was a, an imp kind of guy. He was very fun, and he loved kids, and he loved being a spectacle, having mystery and fun show things to do, and leading kids through the valley of the fairies and where all the gnomes and trolls and, and mystical creatures lived. His core foundational belief is that people are happier when they're kind to each other. So he believed in teaching kids to be kind to each other. They'll learn it and they'll be kinder people and they'll be happier as adults if they learn kindness as kids. Have you ever talked to anyone who actually met him or knew him? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, we have one of our recent benefactors who, as a kid, his grandparents were good friends with George and Felix, his wife. And as a kid, he used to run around here and play and climb on the wizard's tower. He used to swing on the outside of the wizard's tower. And back when people weren't as concerned about safety, apparently. He has as much kindness in his heart as we believe George did. And he tries to kind of emulate him in many ways. That's one of the, the really great uh, returning visitors. It's been wonderful meeting him and knowing him. Okay, could you please introduce yourself for me? I'm Kayla. This is Dominic. Hi, Dominic. How old are you? Uh, six. And what do you think so far of Valley of the Moon? Did you just get here? Yeah, we explored this place a lot. We explored some paths. We found more pretty cool things. I saw the mountain known that was staring at, at the door that I was looking through. Yeah. He was staring at me and I was like, and he just he was just staying in one little spot where I was in. And I can I couldn't really This is our first time finding it. Oh, cool. But I've heard it's a good place for imagination and so that's why we came. We uh, heard that there was gonna be hot chocolate in the front over there. <laughs> yeah. Like hot chocolate in the front. That's a that's good thing. Right. I'm Joanne Redding. And uh, I help out around here. <laughs> My grandkids were in the many plays here. I got drafted to do some cleaning, and uh, I never left. <laughs> and now I tell stories <laughs> to kids, sometimes give away books if we have enough. We're looking for our kids' storybook donations. When you're part of anything that makes kids, just their light comes on inside them. It's like they got a glow around them. They come and they get a piece of candy, they have books, they see the lights, all the fairy garden they just light up inside and it's just it's just, it's just the way to be <laughs> my name is richard kirk crummett that's my full official name i'm the official unicorn of valley of the moon do you know uh, anything about the founder the gentleman who established this place 100 years ago oh george legler he was a he was a male person and he worked for the railroad and he saved up enough money to buy the uh two acres it's now 1.91 acres now he's sold a little bit off of it. But yes, he was a very, very, very nice person. And he was nice to people. And he helped the homeless. And they helped put Valley of the Moon together for him. Could you introduce yourself for me? How old are you and what's your name? Uh, my name is Davos and I'm eight years old. Is this your first trip to Valley of the Moon? Um, No, I went to the last one with the treasure chest. What, what's some of the things you like best about Valley of the Moon? I just like kind of that... You created this entire thing just for people to, you know, wander around and have fun. Hi, what's your name and how old are you? Penny. Three. Penny, is this your first time at Valley of the Moon? Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. <laughs> I'm three, too, but have students. You are very sophisticated three-year-olds. And what's your name? Aria. Aria. I just want to know what you think of Valley of the Moon. Do you like it here? Yeah. Were you surprised to look and see little fairy houses and things like that? Yeah, I just saw one there. What's in there? A fairy. A fairy. Oh, yes. A tall fairy. What do you think about the fairy houses? Good. <laughs> Is there something that you liked the most so far? Butterflies. What about your favorite so far? Uh, what about the spider web? Yeah. You like the spider web? Yeah, I just climbed all the way up. Oh, you climbed on the spider web. Yeah, I just climbed all the way up. Wow. Thank you both for talking to me. I appreciate it very much. You were very brave. <laughs> My name is Jenny Sunshine. I'm the president of the nonprofit that runs Valley of the Moon. 
Give us some idea of the size of the operation. How many employees or volunteers do you think you have? Well, I can tell you exactly how many employees we have. Zero. We do have a variety of volunteers. We sometimes have as many as, I'd say, 50 volunteers at a time, but they come and they go as the plays open up because we need a lot of extra hands for our plays. George Farr-Legler was a very quirky, brilliant fellow. He was obsessed with promoting kindness, being able to give children a great experience before they were seven so that they would learn to be kind the rest of their life. Mostly, we're thankful that the community and the volunteers have supported us this long. It's 100 years not only of being open, it's 100 years of kindness, of one volunteer after another caring enough to keep this place open and preserved for Tucson's community. How much screen time would you say you do in a day, or a week, or how about a year? Next, some thoughts on what a digital detox can help one achieve. Our essayist is Marquez Price, an author, poet, and entrepreneur, the founder and CEO of LLC Teach One Publishing. Marquez Price is an outside contributor to AZPM, and the opinions he expresses are his own. Music for this segment by Brian Lopez. I had a paradoxical epiphany recently while I was holding and looking at the screen of my Android. In the age of technology, where almost anything can be accessed by the kiss of a fingertip and a touchscreen, I started to contemplate what negative effects of screen time could I ascertain through a week of digital detox. Digital detox is known as a period during which one refrains from using electronic devices such as computers or smartphones and is regarded as an opportunity to reduce focus or stress on social interaction in the physical world. Society's dependence on digital devices has increased substantially in recent years. From laptops and smartphones to smart appliances and wearable technology, these devices have become essential and ubiquitous parts of daily life. They facilitate communication, entertainment, health management, shopping, and work amongst others. Nevertheless, This dependence also elevates perturbation about cybersecurity, privacy, and the digital divide. As technology resumes advancement, society's reliance on digital devices is likely to enlarge further, sculpting how we interact with the world as we know it. I wondered if being bereft of technological advantages would make me feel prehistorically inept when I rendered my phone to a mere landline eschewing all apps and cheat codes afforded by the bells and whistles of a smartphone that facilitate the simplest daily tasks. Detoxing digitally has helped me realign healthily with her primarily, as well as others in situations where technology decimates intimate interaction. It has helped me zero in closer through the lens of appreciation when I see my parents on the weekends, beholding the bestowed blessings of still having them both. I laugh a little harder when a friend cracks a joke, amplifying group guffaws during gatherings. My girlfriend reciprocates the same sensory perception I am grateful for. Overall, I feel better and reconnected. Digital connection creates the illusion of connection, and I can see how excessive reliance on digital communication can lead to feelings of isolation and social withdrawal, especially when face-to-face interactions are neglected. To address these issues, I think it's crucial to prioritize face-to-face interactions, establish distinct boundaries for digital usage, work at active listening and empathy in digital communication, and nurture a healthy balance between online and offline interactions. I'm Marquez Price for Arizona Spotlight. Marquez Price's debut poetry collection was called My Train is on Schedule. His latest book of essays is Return of the Observer from LLC Teach One Publishing.
In this next story, produced for Arizona Illustrated on PBS Channel 6, host Tom McNamara visits the AZPM video archive, where 65 years of local television history is kept and is now being preserved for future generations. KUAT Channel 6 started broadcasting to Southern Arizona audiences back on March 8th, 1959. It was the first public station in the state. And since that time, we have produced thousands and thousands of hours of local productions, documentaries, and more. And most of that footage has ended up right here. There are all types of media, film, beta tapes, DVC Pro, and much, much more. And as AZPM prepares to move to the Baker Center for Public Media in the coming years, the time has come to finally figure out what to do with this archive. And here to tell us more about the project is the man tasked with sorting through all this video and organizing it, AZPM alum, John Booth. Good to see you, John. Good to see you too, Tom. You've done, since 1983, you've done it all. You've been a photographer, executive producer. You hired me. Yes. And you, we all make and mistakes. Look. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're the archivist. You're, you, you have a monumental job in front of you. Where do you begin? Well, they were looking for someone that could recognize all the formats, possibly the stories, you know, what was important, Arizona history, and through my 40-year career, I bounced into a lot of that. Uh, how are you determining the wheat from the chaff? What's mm -hmm. the criteria? What's the litmus test? Well, the grant is a Mellon Foundation grant through GBH and the American Archive for Public Broadcasting. Okay. And the, the reason for the grant is to preserve local and regional stories. So they want the stories, they want arts, they want politics, they want... And so it's pretty easy to sort out finished stories or shows and all the field tapes. At the end of the day, the entire collection of 2,000 to 2,500 assets from 16 millimeter film, one inch reel to reel, two inch reel to reel, uh, three quarter inch cassette beta, all the way to digital files will be uploaded onto a digital asset management system here at the U of A, word searchable mm -hmm. uh, by anybody on the planet. You can look at proxy videos and more importantly, word searchable by producers who want to be able to tell the story of, you know, the immigration story over decades instead of just yesterday. All of those assets will also be preserved at the Library of Congress. What's been the biggest surprise so far in what you've found? One general surprise was there's not a new story. I mean, we have sanctuary stories, you know, dealing with immigrants coming across the border and how do we provide sa safety and also justice. And then, and then there's, uh, they're gonna close DM, they're not gonna close DM. Um, there was, the biggest surprise is a story that Peggy Giddings, that was her name back then, Peggy Johnson now, the owner of The Loft, shot, I shot it, she produced it on a trial um, against Joe Bonanno. The famed gangster, oh, yeah. gangster. Yeah. Prosecutor, Rudy Giuliani. Defense attorney, William Kunstler. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest surprise. After Judge Owen told Bonanno he would be cited for contempt if he did not answer the questions, Bonanno complained of chest pains and asked for nitroglycerin. Yes, you saw him on television. I saw him. The man answered every single question the way he wanted to answer it. Uh, he is perfectly capable of answering questions. I felt kind of ashamed to be in the whole proceeding with this sick and ailing man sitting there, surrounded by blood pressure machines and doctors. A friend saw these people, that, these guys that used to lay down cones along Grant and I oh, think yeah. it was 6th. And so in the morning and in the afternoon, they would close off the center lane so that you could get more right. traffic going this way or this way. And it was just this rhythmic, you know, ballet. So with a three quarter inch camera, I shot these guys doing that and put it to music. And it's one of the, my favorite pieces from the archive. Uh, and I would love to find these guys. I don't have their names. They're, you know, I wasn't much of a producer, I, evidently. I didn't take their names down. So if you know these people, let's get a hold of them and make sure they know that they're now be in the Library of Congress. I get up at five. And he'd be to work by six. Then we leave the shop about 25 after, be out there, get the cones all ready. Then we start putting them out. Quarter to seven, we put them down. 
quarter to nine, we start picking up. We're usually off the road at nine. Or mid right two after. after usually not nine. It's timing and rhythm, yeah. The speed on how fast you swing your arm to accord and how fast you're going. He's the best one we've got. This is about four and a half miles we gotta do. And kinda wonder the first time you do it, whether you're gonna get it done in 15 minutes. We had the chair made so we can switch sides, depending on whether we're picking up or putting down. That way traffic's never behind us. <laughs> There's a lot of people around here that, you know, enjoy us. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people, when we're putting out the cones, like mainly in the afternoon, they'll say, it's not 4 o'clock yet. You know, they'll tell me, it's not 4 o'clock. I'm like, yeah, but it takes 15 minutes to put these cones on the road. You can't just start at 4 o'clock and have them down at 4 o'clock. <laughs> also says, no left turns when cones in place. It doesn't specify what time. Yeah. You can do it at 30 miles an hour. He can. 23 is my top. 30 picking up, 23 is top for putting down. Quarter to four, we start putting them down. Then a quarter to six, we start picking them up again. Then we're it for the day until the next day. Wish you the best of luck with a monumental task. At least you're in the air conditioning all summer right. as you sort through and, and get it done. <laughs> so good luck. Thank you, Tom. And always great to see you. Good to see you too. That was Tom McNamara talking to John Booth in the AZPM video archive. You can actually see the story you just heard now at azpm.org. According to Arizona Illustrated producer Andrew Brown, despite sharing video of those city workers from 1988, they've still not been identified. If you know who they are, please tell us about it. And thank you for listening. This show is a production of AZPM. The music is by Calexico. The production engineer is Jim Blackwood. Production assistance by Alicia Vasquez. I'm producer and host Mark McLemore. AZPM's original productions are made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by donations from listeners like you. Learn more at support.azpm.org. Thank you.